I'm E.G. Marshall. Treat your friend as if he will one day become your enemy, and your enemy as if he will one day become your friend. This bit of philosophical advice comes down to us from the days of ancient Rome, and it would seem to be even more valid today. Just stop and think how our friends and enemies have reversed roles in just the past generation. Sometimes you can't tell the good guys from the bad without a scorecard. I don't like him. Why? Why don't you like him? I don't trust him. <laughs> Why don't you trust him? I don't know. You must have a reason. I don't need a reason. Now, you're talking like a woman. But I am a woman. How else should I talk? Oh, forget it. Just remember, he intends to destroy you. And I said it first. Our mystery drama, Did I Say Murder?, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tammy Grimes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Is the head that wears a crown. Of course, it was even truer some seven or eight hundred years ago when there were far more kings than we have today. And a king's basic security did lie in the strength of his sword and the swords of his friends. Friends. Did a king really have friends? Most of them couldn't even trust their own children. Our story will be told by a lady who was perhaps the foremost authority on kings in those turbulent times. After all, she had married two and became the mother of two. Her name? Eleanor of Aquitaine. She speaks from experience. They say I was the most beautiful and the most brilliant woman of my time. Also the most immoral, fickle, and ruthless. I cannot say these accusations are completely without substance. But had I been a man, who would have noticed? When I was 30 years old, I made a tragic mistake. I did what no woman should ever do, because in the end, it will always destroy her. I fell in love. But what could I do? He swept me off my feet. He was hardly more than a boy, and I was a married woman and a mother. And my husband was the king of France. This way! This way, milady! Where? Follow me! Follow me, milady! Where are the others? The others, milady, are engaged in a silly, useless, fruitless pastime. What do you mean? How? And horn for the sake of a skinny red fox. They shall destroy the peasant's field for miles around. You and I need this moment of privacy to discuss a far more important matter. And pray, my young Duke Henry of Normandy, what is that? I am Duke Henry of Normandy, soon to become King Henry of England. Indeed. I had heard that King Stephen has two sons. Stephen is a usurper. My mother is rightful queen. It has been arranged that I shall have the throne on his death. Arranged? How? By the treaty signed at Winchester. And how will this treaty be enforced? By this sword, my lady. Look at it. Both. It belonged to my grandfather, King Henry I. And to my great-grandfather, William the Conqueror himself. And to my great-great-grandfather, Robert. Who was the grandson of a Viking pirate. Of course. You can see how the family continues to better itself. When you and I marry, and you join your provinces of Aquitaine in Poitou to mine of Normandy, we shall be lord and lady of the entire coast of France. <laughs> Did I hear in that ringing declaration somewhere a proposal of marriage? I ask for your hand, my lady. But I'm already married. Oh, not for long. How so? It's hardly a secret. My lady, that your husband has petitioned the Pope for a divorce on grounds of, uh, well, consanguinity. You needn't hesitate over the word, young Duke Henry of Normandy. Consanguinity, indeed. If one must wed beyond the tenth degree of consanguinity, every royal marriage in Europe would have to be annulled. <laughs> Why, your grandfather was Count Fouk of Anjou, which means that you and I are at least third or fourth cousins. Besides, Louis and I were just as consanguine today as we were when we were married 15 years ago. No, no, the word and the cause is not consanguinity. 
but adultery. Oh, what baseless charge I am sure, my lady. Don't try to play the courtier. It doesn't suit you. The charges are true. I am an adulteress. Do you still want me for your wife? Yes, my lady. And you have no fear that I shall be as false to you as I was to Louis? Oh, my lady, even a saint, if she were married to a sleepy, sinful, stupid Louis the Seventh of France, would have to commit adultery or, or go mad. My wife will have no cause to wander. I shall keep her happy and occupied at home. Shall you indeed? How? I love you, my lady Eleanor. I'm sure you love my provinces of Aquitaine and Poitou. Ah, they enhance you. And I love you for another reason as well. What could that possibly be? You remind me of my mother. That's hardly a compliment. Oh, like you, she's resourceful. Clever and capable. She is also mean, petty, and vindictive. As you shall become one day, unless I save you. From what? Her fate. She was a woman alone. That soured her, and with cause. She was the only surviving child of her father. With the grey close of his life, King Henry I called together his nobles and his liegemen and said, Matilda is my heir. She is to become Queen of England. Swear to me that you will be true to her. And they did. Everyone knows this. The old man had no sooner closed his eyes when they broke their vow and Stephen seized the throne. Why? Because he was a man. And she was a woman. Do you know when they all began to take her seriously? No. When she married Geoffrey of Anjou, my father, and gave birth to a son. Me. I was now the heir. The male heir. I legitimized her. Our son shall legitimize you. Our son, too, Henry? You hold Aquitaine in Poitou. But when you are no longer the wife of the King of France, you become a woman, alone. You need my sword and our son. Or else you shall become like my mother, who wandered in the wilderness for 20 years. Yes? Yeah? The horn, the poor fox has been slaughtered, and the heroes return from the hunt. Shall we join them, Eleanor of Aquitaine and Poitou, Queen of England and Duchess of Normandy? He was insufferable, but he was right. He was also handsome. That flaming red hair, those sparkling blue eyes. He was 19 years old. And what a splendid body of a man. But there was an obstacle. That is, it could become an obstacle if Henry would permit. You see, as Duke of Normandy, he was nominally the vassal of the King of France. Technically, he needed the King's permission. Poor Louis. Surely, cousin, you cannot be serious. I intend to marry Eleanor of Aquitaine, my lord. But she is my wife. Oh, your wife no longer, sir. You cast her aside. And for good reason. Oh, yes, for the very best of reasons. I no longer have faith in her virtue. How could I ever be sure any of our children would be my own? My lord, you are speaking of the woman I love. <laughs> As your king, I do not consent to this marriage. For what reason? Have I not explained the reason? It is for your own good. Oh, no, my lord. It is for your own good. I will have her. And I will have Aquitaine and Poitou. And along with Normandy, they shall be English till the end of time. I forbid the marriage. Then, Your Majesty, shall France and England settle the issue by the sword? I am a man of peace, my young hothead. But I warn you, do not push me too far. I intend to marry Eleanor if that pushes you too far. You, my lord, will have to unsheathe the sword of France. <laughs> He didn't know what to make of it. Had he struck quickly and decisively before Henry became king of England, this story might never have been told. But as usual, he delayed and debated, and meanwhile Henry and I were married. Then he delayed and debated some more until King Stephen of England died. Then it was too late. Henry and I were crowned king and queen in Westminster Abbey. We made 
made such a handsome couple. Everyone was delirious with joy to have the legitimate king on the throne. Listen. Yes, my lord. The Frankish men, they had a queen. Eleanor, Eleanor. Never was such a beauty seen. Eleanor, Eleanor. Her raven hair, her flashing eyes. Heaven sent from paradise. Eleanor, Eleanor. How do you know that poem? When you accompanied Louis on a pilgrimage to the Holy Grail, this poem was written by a captured Saracen minstrel. And who told you about it? I have made it my business to find out everything about you, milady. Have you? Why? I told you. I love you. My mother objected to this match. Of course. How could she give you up to another woman? What an odd thing to say. <laughs> We've made an enemy for life. I know. King Louis. My mother wanted to avoid that. For 20 years, she needed Louis' help to fight Stephen. She still sees Louis as her ally. But he is England's enemy. Yes. Well, at any rate, I refuse to marry Helga. My mother asked why. Because I don't love her. I answered. Love, she exclaimed. Royalty does not marry for love. Royalty marries for power, for money. I know. That's why my father married me off to Louis. And I said to my mother, the woman I marry must bring to me all those things. But in addition... I must also love her. And you love me, Henry? Oh, yes, Eleanor. Eleanor, my queen, my lady, my wife. We shall love each other as long as we live. I didn't expect him to love me as long as that. It's not in a man's nature. Not in a king's nature, at any rate. There would be other women. And I would grow older. But in the here and the now... Which is really all any of us have. He loved me. The years passed. We had children. Especially boys. Henry, Richard, John. My lord was happy. Contented. And in love. I waited for the signs. There were a few minor liaisons here and there. But nothing serious. And then one day... My love, may I present Thomas of Beckett, deacon of Canterbury? My lady. Sir. The Archbishop speaks quite highly of him. The king is too kind. I prevailed upon the deacon to give us the benefit of his counsel. I'm sure we shall all be the wiser for it. The deacon is perhaps the most learned man in the realm. He studied law in Bologna, theology in Rome, course at Oxford, and uh, Paris. We are honored to have such a distinguished scholar in our midst. Well, Thomas Beckett, now that you've found our court, you must not be a stranger here. I thank your grace. I shall expect you to dine with us tomorrow at noon. I shall be there. You have a permission to withdraw. My lord. My lady. Oh, that man is a find. A treasure. Henry. I shall appoint that man Chancellor of a Kingdom. Chancellor? Well, why not? He does all the work now. The superior Archbishop Theobald, who's supposed to be my Prime Minister, is too old, too tired to do anything but sleep all day. Henry, I want to tell you something. I tell you, he's a man of ideas, of, of, of intelligence, of imagination. Henry, listen. Get rid of him. What? Get rid of him. I don't understand. There's nothing to understand. Just dismiss him. Why? I'm afraid of him. Afraid? And don't ask me why. I couldn't tell you. It's just that I feel a chill wind when he looks at me. Oh, nonsense. It may be nonsense, but it's true. You're being a woman. Why not? I am a woman. Henry, get rid of him before he destroys us. And here we are, back to women and their alleged intuitions. In these liberated days, one hesitates to ascribe unique qualities to the ladies. But this story takes place around the year 1156 or 7, when women had very little going for them and had to develop every single talent they possessed. Well, we'll see what develops in Act 2, live in a harmonious relationship. But such is not always the case in the world we have to put up with. A trio is always more difficult to manage than a duo. And so, eventually, something or someone has to give... We are listening to Eleanor of Aquitaine, who has become Eleanor, Queen of England. I think that was the day it began. That was the day I lost Henry. 
That was the day he fell out of love. Or perhaps he let love die. Or love was no longer a thing of importance. And I'm not even saying he was aware of what was happening. But that was the day. My dear, you must spare me for a few days. Thomas and I are making plans for the construction of a fleet. A fleet? Yeah. This may be the right time for an invasion of Ireland. Ireland? Do you seriously propose to subjugate the Irish? Oh, now is the season for it. Why do we want Ireland? Because we don't conquer it, Louis will. Let him. Are you serious? We cannot tolerate the French in Ireland. Let the French spill their blood and waste their treasure. My dear, Beckett could convince you how important it is for England to control Ireland. Beckett here, Beckett there. Beckett all day long. Does he set England's policies now? Eleanor, you have taken a most unreasonable dislike to the wisest and most talented man in the kingdom. If you keep saying that, then the people will soon ask, why isn't Beckett king? Why, why do you dislike Beckett? I don't know. But there must be a reason. I don't trust him. Why? I don't know. Well, I must meet with my privy council. Which is headed by Beckett, of course. <sighs> I shall see you this evening. I hope to find you in a better temper. My lady. You may be seated. Thank you. It is gracious of you to receive me. I could not easily refuse to see the Chancellor of the realm. Why do you dislike me? You're not good for my husband. In what way? You fill his head with dreams of impossible conquest. I believe that Henry must achieve his destiny. And what is his destiny? To make England the strongest nation on earth. By a series of dangerous, bloody foreign adventures? My lady, England must first be made strong here at home. Henry must get what is rightfully his. He already has what is rightfully his, the crown. For 20 years, Stephen bought the loyalty of the barons and the church. He gave them money. He gave them lands. He gave them privileges. This treasure belongs to the crown. Henry must win it back. You're a clever man, Thomas Beckett. What do you want? I want to serve my king. What do you want for yourself? Hmm? Oh, a little wealth, a little fame, and a little glory. And what else? What else is there? You want something, Thomas Beckett. I can see it in your wild eyes. <laughs> my wild eyes? Men call you a scholar. Your learning is beyond question. But tell me, what drives you, Thomas? Why do you say that word? I'm not a queen who has lived in a convent, nor one who has never ventured forth from the nursery. I have lived by my wits in this world. I know driven men when I see them. Very well, my lady, I am driven. To what impossible deeds? I feel that I am driven by God. But to what end and for what purpose? have not yet been revealed. You're the worst kind of fanatic, Thomas. A religious one. I began to see less and less of the king. Beckett, it seems, had raised a barrier between us. And of course, by now, there were stories of parties. Actually, people were afraid to use the word orgies in my presence. I had been raised in France, attended the court in Paris, and, of course, seen my share of depravity. No king, unless he's a saint, is above this type of thing. But Henry, I fear, was carrying matters too far. You sent for me, my lady? Yes, Baron Fitzers. Where is the king today? Uh, the king? Well, I'm afraid I cannot say. Reginald Fitzers, you are the king's most loyal servant. He looks upon you as his faithful dog. It's the truth, and I am proud of it. And yet. If I were to insist on it, he would have you broken on the rack. Where is the king? Well, there is a place. A certain house in London. Yes? Everybody knows about it, my lady. Everybody, it seems, but me. Well, His Majesty and Beckett go there quite often. I see. Well, the ladies must be very special. Escort me there. Your Majesty... At once. It was the home, a most palatial mansion, 
on Sir Faris de Montjoy. A most apt name, for he was easily the most depraved scoundrel in England. I walked inside. Who would dare to bar my path? The king and Beckett were in a private room with several young ladies. The curtained archway was partially open. I could see. I could hear everything. Now, little more will offer you. Thomas and I have serious things to talk about. Isn't that so, Thomas? We always have serious things to talk about. So, little Maud, you and your... What's the name of yours, Thomas? I don't remember. Ask her. She's fallen asleep. Wake her. Well, that would be most unkind. True. Little Maud, you sit quiet. Thomas and I must have a conference on affairs of state. Thomas, the Archbishop grows older. Mm, as do all of us. Ah, but he is really old, Thomas. Poor dear kind, Theobald. He is not long for the world here below. Ah, no, but he'll be welcomed in the world above. Without doubt, Your Majesty. And who shall then become Archbishop of Canterbury, Primate of England? Yes. Who? It is my responsibility to appoint the new Archbishop. Oh, that you must be aware. It is the law, Your Majesty. Ah. Thomas Abbey, whom do you suggest I appoint Archbishop of Canterbury, Primate of England? Modesty forbids me to reply. Modesty? Ha! <laughs> well, that's a jest for you, isn't it, Thomas? It's a capital jest, my lord. There was no point to listening to any more of it. I returned home swiftly. So Beckett had obviously achieved his coveted goal. Now he was second in power to the king himself. Or if he looked at it a certain way, he was equal in power. If you cared to look at it in still another way, a time could arise and a circumstance be created where he could be even more powerful than the king. My dear, how have you been? Well, and you? Oh, my health is excellent. Uh, have I interrupted anything? I was merely sewing. I require your advice. Theobald is dead. May his good soul rest in peace. Ah, I must choose his successor. Whom do you suggest? Anyone but Thomas a. Beckett. What is this unnatural hatred you nurture for Beckett? And what is this unnatural affection you have for him? He's a man of the highest learning. Can you deny that? No. He's highly skilled in the arts of diplomacy and negotiation, true? Yes. And he's the most able, and I will say, honest administrator. Is that not a fact? It's a fact. Is there any prelate in the realm more qualified for the post? Well, is there? Dismiss him. Why? He'll destroy you. How? Ah, uh, you can't tell me. Well, you should know. I've decided to appoint him. I thought you wanted my advice. I did. But only if it didn't conflict with your own intention. Oh, why are you so difficult? Because I love you. Eleanor. Yes? Do you want to say that you no longer love me? Oh. When one falls in love, then love is all. It, it, it possesses one completely. But life and work and responsibility go on, increase, make demands. And therefore love... Dies. No. It just... Oh, love becomes a part of life. An unimportant part. No. But it no longer has a consuming flame. The consuming flame. Oh, you Plantagenets. You do know how to turn a phrase. Oh, Eleanor, I still love you. Still? Oh, do not attempt to choke me with words, Eleanor. I appointed Thomas because he will help me curb the encroaching powers of the church. I appointed Thomas because the primate of England must be the trusted servant of the king. I hope he doesn't disappoint you. Thomas and I, Eleanor, we're... We're like brothers. Yes. Closer than brothers. <laughs> How many brothers try to betray each other and kill each other? Don't trust Beckett. I will hear no more of that. Do you understand? Oh, yes, my liege lord. Shall I join my ladies in their sewing? Or perhaps retire to the nursery to feed my babies? Now, Eleanor... If you wanted a cow for a wife, why did you marry me? It's, it's just this unreasonable attitude you have towards Thomas Beckett. He has poisoned the air between us. But wait, just wait. 
the evils he shall bring down on this house of Plantagenet has scarcely begun. Actually, Thomas of Beckett seems like a perfectly sound and reliable chap. From the viewpoint of sheer ability, Henry could not have made a better choice. Which of them is right? We always answer questions of this type in the third act. I'm... She was one of the great women of her time. But it was the wrong time. Quite simply, it was the wrong time to be a woman. A woman was nothing. Nobody. Nobody. A mere chattel who belonged to her husband, her father, her brother, or to any man who could claim kinship or responsibility. A smart woman could only make a man feel uncomfortable. Smart women, therefore, pretended to be stupid women. It made life less complicated. Unfortunately, Eleanor of Aquitaine was too smart for her own good. Ah, the newly created Archbishop of Canterbury. Good day to you, Your Excellency. You did not come to see me. I came to see you. And why should I come to see you? To talk of those matters that concern your soul. Come, Thomas Beckett. Yes, despite your robes of office, despite your august titles and powers, I know you as the ambition-ridden, driven little clerk. I forgive you, my lady. For what? The sin of slander. Ah, Talking of sin, do you and my husband still enjoy yourselves at the house of Faris de Montjoy? Not to mention other similar sundry places. Oh, I no longer concern myself with the false pleasures of the flesh, my lady. My destiny is to serve my God. Henry would say, and I would agree, that your destiny is to serve your king. But my beloved sister, I serve Henry best by serving God first. I think Henry would prefer the order reversed. Ah, I have come to give you my blessing. One good turn deserves another, Your Excellency. I shall give you my advice. You are familiar with the admonition. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things which are God's. Of course, my lady. When in doubt, a prudent archbishop will always side with Caesar. Oh, thank you for the advice, my lady. Somehow, I sense you shall not follow it. I can only follow my conscience, my lady. That's what I'm afraid of. My lady. Why have you asked to see me, Baron Fitzhurst? Oh, my lady, this is a very, uh, uh... Delicate? Yes, <laughs> delicate. I'd have never thought of that word, but it's what I need. For what purpose? My loyalty is to King Henry. Your loyalty has never been questioned. I never really liked Thomas Beckett. Oh? I like him less even now. Why? Have you ever been to his house, my lady? I managed to deny myself that privilege. But you heard about it. You see, I never saw a man spend money... I should say, throw away money like he does. His house was furnished... <laughs> furnished in the finest way. You ate off silver plates, drank from golden goblets. Such food and... and entertainment. I won't go into that in your presence, my lady. I appreciate your delicacy. Well, he's given it all up. He sold the house. Everything he owned. And, and they say he gave the money to the poor. He lives in a little room in the cathedral. He has no servants. He cooks his own food. Marvelous. What is he up to, my lady? Up to? A lion doesn't change his spots. I think you mean a leopard. (laughs) What what I really mean is a fox. A sharp, shrewd, sly fox. Is he trying to become a leader of the people? An interesting thought, Fitzhurst. I started to mention this to the king, but he gave me a look... Uh, You know that look, my lady. Yes, indeed. And I would give my life for my king. And so I came here to tell you. I appreciate your loyalty, Fitzhurst. What was Thomas Beckett thinking of? What was this sudden change in character? Or was it on the surface only? Soon we were to receive a rude shock. 
Henry summoned Thomas to appear before him. It was a legal matter. I was shocked at Thomas's appearance. He was dressed in a most simple robe. He carried a staff. He wore sandals. Henry pretended not to notice. He plunged right into the heart of the matter. My good friend, William Dainsford, has ejected a priest from the rectory on his manor. I have heard, Your Majesty. And you have excommunicated him for doing so. Yes. I demand that you revoke that sentence immediately. Why, Your Majesty? My vassal has the right to choose the priest for his parish. Only I have that right, Your Majesty. Oh, naturally. But common sense should tell you to accommodate a wish of your king. Now, without further delay, revoke that sentence. It is not for the king to decide whom I shall excommunicate and whom I shall absolve. Who says it is not? I do. You! I appointed you, remember? You appointed me to be the servant of God. Beckett, there has been talk that you've lost your sense. I dismissed it as jealous gossip, but I see now there's truth. You may amuse yourself with this display of poverty and chastity. At any rate, you will absorb Sir William Daines for immediately. He did it. But he didn't do it immediately. And he didn't do it willingly. It was obvious that Beckett had declared war on Henry. And chose this time to retreat for tactical reasons. But that was the start of the rift between them. As an expert on rifts, I could see it all so clearly. And I knew how it must end, eventually. Of course, the king needed someone to talk to. And whom could he trust? Me. I, I can't believe it. Does he actually intend to build a power for himself that will win him a throne? No, he merely seeks to serve God. Oh, he's mad. That's why it would be advisable to kill him. What are you saying? You know what I'm saying. If he dies now, accidentally, there's little harm done. If he lives much longer, you'll make him a martyr. The church will make him a saint. Get rid of him now while it's cheap. Later, it may be too expensive. Oh, what happened, Eleanor? We were of one mind, one accord, one ambition. To win back for the crown all the authority that Stephen had given away. That's why I appointed him. How can a man suddenly disown all his ideas and principles... Possibly because he's adopted a set of different ones. Your authority is being washed away like a sandcastle on the seashore. I'll bring Thomas to heel. The clergy must come under the rule of the crown. I'll never yield on that principle. Who's Thomas or Beckett to declare war on the king? Suddenly a conflagration had flared up in the country. Naturally it was fed and fanned by Louis of France always eager to harass Henry. And it lasted almost ten years. Beckett's strength lay with the mass of the common people. To them, he was the popular hero. Beckett had gone to Rome. He was gaining support. Finally, an uneasy truce was patched up between the two of them. But it couldn't last, and I knew it. Somebody had to do something. Your Majesty. Finally, Your Excellency, I have come to see you. As a queen... Or as a daughter of the church? As both. Thomas, let us throw aside the pretenses. Pretenses? This conflict will destroy both of you. It may end in a bloodbath for all England. What would you have me do? Compromise. Each of you has tremendous power. If each of you is determined not to abuse it, then neither of you shall have a grievance. But I see now that argument is fruitless. When you say you seek a better life, I know now. What that look in your eyes signifies. You seek martyrdom. To seek martyrdom is to commit the sin of vanity. I seek merely justice and truth. Words, Thomas, words. Well, I cannot promise you martyrdom. But I can predict death. I shall die in the arms of God. Are you sure it won't be in the arms of the devil? The conflict deepened and became more envenomed. Henry became more and more despondent. He took to drinking and lamenting in his apartments with a few of his chosen companions. But you could hear him all over the palace. He says he's willing to obey me in all those matters concerning God. Well, who would decide what that is? He would. 
And soon he'd be king. Is that so? <laughs> yes, Your Majesty. He provokes the people. He fans the flames of revolt. People arm themselves and follow him. Isn't that true? Oh, yes. Yes, Your Majesty. And no one does anything. Nothing. Here's a fellow that I raised to power and glory with my own hand. Now he dares to tread on me, insult me, drag my name through the dust. And no one does anything. Not one of the cows that I nourish here at my table, not one will deliver me from this turbulent clerk, this meddlesome priest. Not one of you, not... Not, not one of you. The king sleeps. Now, who will come with me? Who will join Reginald Fitzurse? You, William Tracy? You, Hugh de Morville? You, Richard Le Breton? I heard the clatter of their armor and the clanking of their swords as they rushed through the hall. I ran into Henry's chamber. He was half drunk and half asleep. Mm, no one does anything. Henry, Fitzurse and Tracy and the others... They're leaving for Canterbury to kill Beckett. No one does anything. They're going to do everything. Henry, is this what you want? You can still stop them. Is this what you want? No man loved a friend as much as I love Beckett. You can still stop them. Do you want to? I want to sleep. Sleep. Henry. Henry. Uh, Henry, listen. I want to sleep. Forget false friendships and betrayal. Later did he know? I don't know. I only know that Fitzhurst and his followers bound themselves together by an oath. And I know that they confronted Beckett in the cathedral at Canterbury. And as Fitzhurst later confessed, they suddenly lost their nerve. But Beckett, Beckett would have it no other way what do you hear in this holy place with drawn swords? Well, speak. We come that... That you may repent your disobedience to your lord, the king. One may only show repentance to God. We demand that you acknowledge the king as your master. I freely acknowledge the king as my master. <laughs> well, then there is no longer a quarrel between us. And I acknowledge that God is master of us both. And you will follow the king's orders. I will follow God's orders. Oh, Thomas Beckett, I remember you when we, we would all drink together and spend our days and nights together in various places. Oh, Thomas, I was your friend because the king loved you. He loves you still. Don't force me to... Kneel, Reginald Fitzhurst, kneel. And show yourself a loyal son of the Lord. Acknowledge, Thomas. Acknowledge the mastery of the king. I don't want your blood on my hands. Acknowledge your king. I will die first. Then die. Die now! When the news was brought to Henry, he was seized with shock and grief and horror. He shut himself up in his room. He refused food, drink, or consolation for three days. He would see no one. Finally, he sent for me. Eleanor. I have written a letter to the Pope in your name. I let him know how grieved, how outraged, and of course, how innocent you are. I asked him to reserve judgment till he heard the full details of the story. He's dead, Eleanor. He's dead. Yes. Finally. I shall hang Fitzhurst and the others at once. Yes. Condemn them to the scaffold and then commute the sentences. Everyone will say I killed him. They'll say I ordered the crime. And did you, Henry? Did you? I don't know. As God is my judge, I don't know. matter must rest for eternity, or until such time as these things are made known to us. But it was one of the great mysteries of history, which is why it is grist for our mill. Our mill will keep grinding when I return shortly. 
Did you ever want to own your own business? It might be simpler than you think. We can take the mystery out of it. Here's the first clue. We're the largest instant printing chain in the world. Right. You got it. Postal Instant Press. Pip. Now, clue number two. You can get into a franchise for a lot less than you think, and the balance of the purchase price after your down payment will be completely financed by PIP at below the prime interest rate upon credit approval. We can bring a lot of witnesses, too. Take the man and wife running their own business and doing well, the singles who are part of PIP's success story, the retirees, or many more in the growing PIP family. All of these people are just part of the evidence. PIP trains you, backs you, helps you get started, keeps you going. If you really want to be your own boss, take a tip from Pip. Call toll-free 800. Ah, pour on the snack. Morning seems to start out better. You seem to go much better. When you start the day together, Like no other coffee. Always good to the last drop. Adventure, romance, fantasy. The stars we know and love to see. We're taking the movies to America. The Movie Channel brings you America's best movies 24 hours a day. Whenever you turn on your TV set, you'll see an endless variety of great movies. Just call your local cable TV company and ask for the Movie Channel by name. The Movie Channel. All movies 24 hours a day. recorded history. I'm told they discovered loaded dice in one of the tombs of ancient Egypt. Did the pharaohs cheat or were they cheated? Are you an easy mark or do you have the sense to know nobody hands you nothing for nothing? Don't be gulled into believing you can pyramid yourself a fortune or that an honest man can't be deceived. He certainly can. Who said that? Why, our old friend Ben Franklin. Who else? Our cast included Jennifer Harmon, Joan Shea, Mandel Kramer, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. is an air traffic controller. But don't look for him the next time you're flying. Skip works for the Navy. 203, slightly above flight path, on course. Some of the best people in their fields are working for the Navy. They're Navy-trained men and women who joined to learn a highly technical skill and chose to turn their experience into Navy careers. It's a demanding job, very demanding. But it's important, personally rewarding, and you can feel good about it. We wouldn't be the best Navy in the world without people like Skip Calvert. Navy career men and women who not only believe in being the best at what they do, but also believe it means more when it's done for their country. Call the ball. Navy know-how. It's working for America. K-C-M-O. Kansas City. Mutual News. Democrats on Capitol Hill Tuesday blasted the Reagan administration's plans to bail out the Social Security system by cutting some future benefits. Mutual White House correspondent Bill Grudy reports the Reagan administration is rethinking its sweeping proposals. When the plan was unveiled, officials called it a bold new initiative to save Social Security from going belly up. Now, Deputy News Secretary Larry Speaks describes the plan as nothing more than a package of ideas. 
Speaks says it was sent up to Capitol Hill at the request of Congress, and he indicates the president is not prepared to fight for it, as Mr. Reagan is fighting for the administration's economic package. Speaks says the president's proposals are still the best way to go, but in the next breath, he admits Congress could come up with something even better. Bill Grudy, Mitchell News, the White House. Michigan voters Tuesday overwhelmingly rejected a proposal known as Proposition A. The referendum measure would have lowered property taxes.